Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the College of Behavioral, Social, and Health Sciences Inclusive Excellence Lecture Series. My name is Denise Anderson. I'm the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Studies and Faculty Affairs, and I'm pleased that you can join us on this Friday. With a focus on the research and outreach work of the faculty in the college, the lecture series has been designed to take an in-depth look over the course of the semester on a current top topic of relevance within the context of expertise within this college. This fall, there is nothing more timely than a focus on the elections. We have an exceptional lineup of scholars who are going to help us look more closely at the elections with a specific focus on healthcare and mental health systems and disparities as issues of importance. To help kick us off this examination, today we welcome two distinguished faculty from our Department of Political Science who will speak on mental health COVID-19 in the 2020 elections. Laura Olson is Thurman Professor of Political Science and Director of the PhD Program in Policy Studies at Clemson University. She has been a U.S. Fulbright Scholar to Italy, President of the Society for the Scientific Study of Religion, and Editor-in-Chief for the Journal of Scientific Study of Religion. Her research focuses on contemporary religion and politics with emphases on public opinion and civic engagement. Her work has appeared in scholarly journals including Political Research Quarterly and Social Science Quarterly. She has also published nine books, most recently Religion and Politics in America, Faith, Culture, and Strategic Choices. Jeff Fine is Professor of Political Science, where his research and teaching focus on American politics, including the U.S. Congress, elections, public policy, and social media. He currently serves as the Higher Ed Co-Chair for the AP U.S. Government and Politics exam. He previously served as a Congressional Fellow through the American Political Science Association, where he worked on the domestic policy staff of the United States Senator. So please help me in welcoming our speakers, I know that they have a lecture plan for approximately 25 to 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, certainly feel free. We've got, I think, a group size that would allow for you un unmuting yourself and going in and asking the question if that's what you prefer. The chat room we will also have open if you prefer to type in a question, and we'll monitor that as well. So with that said, I'll turn it over to our speakers. Thank you ever so much, Dean Anderson, and thanks to the college for having us. Um, we're very excited um, to be able to talk about these topics today. These are obviously topics that are so fraught, topics that are so important, um, topics that are in so many ways unprecedented um, in their importance and in their unpredictability in a lot of ways. Um, so what we're going to do is talk some about the political context within which these various concerns about health, um, both in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also later I'll talk about um, in the context of mental health. Um, how some of these pieces fit together, right? And how we might begin to address, and in the uh, subsequent lectures, think some about the specific health piece. Um, we, after we set the, I think, agenda around the political context, the health piece will come into play even more in the next two um, talks. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Fine, who will start us out. Thanks, Dr. Olson. I'm really excited to be here to talk about this intersection between healthcare, mental health, and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and the 2020 elections. Um, so what I wanna do is to give you a little bit of uh, background into sort of where we are in American politics and then talk about how those things specifically are gonna to relate to these topics, so this intersection. So if we look at where the political environment is in 2020, there's a few um, key things to understand which will then help shape um, what we're gonna discuss for uh, the rest of the talk. So one is that we live in a time where negative partisanship is, um, is it's increasing and it's dominant. And what we mean by negative partisanship is that people are more motivated by and are more willing to identify against a party than with one. So rather than saying I am a Republican or I am a Democrat, it's I'm really not one of those people. I'm really not a member of this other party. And using that as a a lens through which you see the world. And we certainly see negative partisanship is on the rise, and I'll show you that in just a second. Um, we also live in a time where politics and partisanship have become intertwined with our identities in ways that they weren't before. So when you think about what it means, like who you are and what you consider yourself to be, partisanship and um, your, your worldview is shaped by that, and it bleeds beyond uh, just political views. It bleeds into um, your personal life. So we have more people today saying, 
um, they wouldn't want their child to marry someone from the other party. That's way up from where it used to be just even a few decades ago. So, you know, we are members of these, these warring tribes and we identify with these, these groups in a way that are central to who we consider ourselves to be. And that's gonna be important. And also we have a time where um, motivated reasoning is um, gonna shape a lot of um, how we view the world. And so what we mean by motivated reasoning is that, you know, it's, it's not like, you know, you get a piece of information, you sort of carefully consider how that relates to your own worldview and use that to inform opinions. Rather, people are grabbing opinions and they're, they're gravitating to political worldviews based on what they want to find. And so they're sort of starting with the answer they want to have and then, um, and that's also tied to their identity and using that to sort of shape their opinions. And so what I'm gonna do is sort of quickly walk through some examples of where we see this at the intersection of health, healthcare, COVID-19 and the elections. So negative partisanship, this gives you some sense about how negative partisanship has been rising over time. So um, what you have here are the 2008 and the 2016 elections. And you've got Republicans on the top, uh, you've got Democrats on, on the bottom. This is coming from Pew Research Center. Uh, and what it asks people is, would you say that you're more against the other candidates? If you look at 2008, for example, among Republicans, you know, almost 60% of people were voting for John McCain as opposed to voting against Obama. Uh, among Democrats, 68% were voting for Obama rather than just voting against McCain. By the time you jump uh, forward to 2016, those percentages have shifted. Um, so it's lower for Democrats, Hillary Clinton, uh, but on the Republican side, a majority were voting against Clinton more so than voting for Trump. Uh, we had the two most unpopular candidates ever in 2016 in terms of how they were viewed, uh, and that negative partisanship really, um, you know, was borne out by uh, by the election. If you look at this election, uh, you've now got um, Trump supporters on the top and Biden supporters on the bottom, um, and especially if you look among, well, so for Trump people, uh, you can see that um, you know he's not Biden is is 20 percent, so that you know negative partisanship is there. Although this motivation based on the, you know, against Democrats also might pick up some of this, but look for Democrats. So we've got Biden down here, a full 56% of people say the reason they're going to vote for Biden is because he's not Trump. And so we have that as something that's gonna be really central in these conversations. So that's negative partisanship in 2020. Um, what does our, um, our sort of like identity now look like? So this shows you um, mask usage by party over time. Uh, and what you can see is we've seen a split in how Democrats and Republicans have responded to the pandemic uh, and how likely they are to say they've worn a mask or considered wearing a mask recently. Um, and so the gap is closed, uh, which, is, which is encouraging as someone who wants to see um, you know, public health prevail here. Uh, you can see it's almost universal among Democrats, but it's much lower among Republicans. Uh, and for all the things I'll show you, you'll find independence sort of, you know, tracking somewhere in between the two. So rather than, um, you know, neutrally assessing the health risks and making a decision, what we have is Democrats and Republicans responding differently to this crisis. We see the same thing in terms of the potential vaccines. So, and you've seen it shift over time. So this is showing, this is from Pew again, showing how likely Americans are to want to get the vaccine when it becomes available. Uh, and what you can see is early on, so among all adults, lots of people were willing to say, 72% were willing to say in May that they would get the vaccine. That's down to only about half of people. Uh, and you can see that these shifts are particularly strong um, across parties. So you can see that Democrats have gone from almost 80% of people saying they would get the vaccine now to about 60% of people. Uh, part of this is, um, you know, the, the landscape of, you know, will the vaccine be safe? There's some recent reports about some uh, a vaccine being halted, um, but we're seeing these sort of partisan differences first at the baseline and also seeing them shift over time. So partisanship is playing a role in how people are willing to respond to these crises. In terms of the views of the pandemic, so um, is, are things getting better or are they not? So this shows you more of that, um, that sort of motivated reasoning here. So uh, what you have is um, look at Democrats versus Republicans and, and this red box in the, uh, in the middle is independence. So is the worst ahead of us or is the worst behind us uh, in terms of the pandemic? 
And what you see in terms of public opinion, this is coming from uh, Kaiser Family Foundation. Uh, they are, uh, they show that most Democrats think that the worst is yet to come. Most Republicans think that things are, are getting better. The worst is behind us. And independents are here stuck in the middle. Independents reflect this overall total. Um, and so um, we see they're gonna be the ones that are cross pressured, right? They're the ones that are gonna get these mixed messages and um, they're gonna be the ones that are gonna be the sort of most crucial to figuring out how this is gonna play out in terms of the impact of, of this on the election. So again, we see um, partisan differences here. In terms of what people care about though, what do, what do voters care about for this election and how central are these issues of healthcare and mental health and uh, the pandemic in that? Um, if you go back to the 2018 midterm elections, the, the issue that dominated the landscape was healthcare. Um, and so, especially among Democratic candidates, they were really highlighting this. And so that was the big issue. And if you look at 2020, and you go back before, at least before the pandemic became um, really salient in the United States, although the, pandemic, the, uh, the virus was certainly already here at that, at that time. So if you look at February, the leading issue among registered voters was healthcare. 26% of people said that was the most important um, issue to them in terms of their, uh, their vote this year. Uh, the economy was second. Obviously the, the pandemic isn't on, um, isn't on their list. If you jump to May, the economy is now the number one issue. Healthcare has dropped uh, and you can see COVID-19 is starting to rise. So 17% of people, so a full 40% of people in May said that some type of healthcare issue, either healthcare more broadly or the, the coronavirus outbreak specifically, were gonna drive their vote share. By the time we get to 2020, healthcare has dropped significantly. So overall, the Affordable Care Act, Medicare, um, Medicare for all, all of those things have dropped. Um, and what you see is a landscape dominated by the economy and COVID-19. Um, you can obviously see the rise of, of uh, criminal justice policing and race relations, which makes sense given um, everything that's happened since uh, George Floyd's murder all the way through the summer with civil unrest and protests. Uh, but still, these two issues, the economy and COVID are dominating the landscape now, and we really can't separate the two. So people's view of the economy are shaped by the fact that the economy has, um, has taken a big hit since um, the outset of the, of the coronavirus. So this shows you what people look like overall. But again, partisanship matters here and motivated reasoning matters here. So let me show you what that looks, this looks like when you break it down by party. So among Democratic voters on the left, you can see that the largest issue for Democratic voters is COVID. So 36% of people say that's the most important issue to them when they're considering who to vote for for president. Uh, you can see that healthcare has dropped a lot. It's down to 14% among Democrats. It was a full third of people in, in May. The economy is lower for, for Democrats. And not surprisingly, race relations is, is a really salient issue beyond the issues that we're gonna to discuss today. On the Republican side, the dominant issue is the economy. That's the lens through which uh, Republicans are going to be looking at the election uh, much less focus on healthcare. Only 4% of people say healthcare. Only 4% of people say COVID, the actual virus itself. So the issue is very, um, very split among these two, these two groups where we have Democrats who COVID is the main issue for them. For Republicans, it's the economy or, or in something else. And even just maybe like a, a short sidebar since I'm a political nerd and can't resist. Uh, if you look at the way that Democrats and Republicans are talking differently about some of these same issues related to criminal justice, policing, race relations. Republicans are really focused on the criminal justice and policing side, and Democrats are really focused on the race relations side. So even there, you see these, these two different tribes. And then finally, I just wanna show you uh, what the candidates are talking about and why these are gonna be really salient issues for the election, but not all necessarily for the same people. So um, this, these data are coming from, um, from the Wesleyan Media Project. And so on the left, uh, what you're gonna see here are the slide that's, uh, the graph that's already up on the slide. What percentage of Joe Biden's ads discuss a particular issue? So what is Biden talking about during, it, during the campaign? Uh, so it shows all the issues that have at least 10% of support. Uh, COVID-19 is the three that have the numbers are the three that are health related. COVID-19, a full 70% of, um, of his ads relate to the pandemic, 31% for healthcare, lower for expanding access access to healthcare. For Trump, it doesn't register at all. 
So Trump's ads are focusing largely on crime and protests. Uh, there's very little about um, the virus, healthcare. None of those things make it into at least 10% of Trump's ads. So what we have are these things that reinforce each other. Uh, what the candidates talk about is based on what people care about and what people care about is driven by what candidates are talking about. So if you're, a, if you're an independent voter, you have this uncertainty, right? You've got Biden saying one thing, you've got Trump saying something else. They don't speak to one another at all. And so you're really left with trying to figure out which of these things to sort of believe or which of these issues to, um, to really care more about in terms of your vote. And so a lot of what the election looks like is gonna be shaped by when an independent voter, and especially an independent voter in a handful of key states in the Electoral College, when they go to the voting booth, are they more thinking about the issues that we're talking about today, or are they more talking about crime and, and thinking about crime and protest? That will shape a lot about um, what the election looks like going forward. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll leave it there and turn it back over to my colleague, Dr. Olson. Thank you, Dr. Fine. Let me see if I can play. There we go. You know, the tech thing, right? I just, I want everything to be seamless and then we gotta press buttons for tech. In any event, um, I'm gonna talk very briefly about the health environment right now and particularly focus on mental health care, as I said, and connect some of these things to, this, to the sort of subjects that, um, that Dr. Fine just So it goes without saying that the big sort of contextual piece health-wise is the COVID-19 outbreak, the pandemic, with nearly 200,000 Americans having passed away in the last six months. And we'll certainly get to and above that 200,000 threshold um, before we vote in, I think, 46 days at this point, 47. Um, the next sort of piece here, obviously would be, as Dr. Fine also indicated, the economic fallout of the pandemic, which has it not, not just sort of mental health sort of concerns, but very basic kinds of concerns around healthcare, because obviously in this country, we tie healthcare to employment. You lose your job, often you lose your health insurance, which not only creates obvious physical challenges in terms of one's health, but also presumably, certainly increases anxiety as well. Um, meanwhile, in the background, and this is a fascinating fact, given the fact, given that, as Dr. Fine just pointed out, the campaigns are really not talking much about the Affordable Care Act, but one week after we vote, the Supreme Court, in this case that's going to be called or is now called California versus Texas, which if that doesn't summarize our political reality right now, I don't know what does. California versus Texas um, is a case where in one sentence, um, Texas, is Texas and 17 other states are arguing that the Affordable Care Act can and should be rendered entirely invalid creating more uncertainty, right? And again, it's really, it's in the background in terms of the public discourse right now, but it is nevertheless another potential source of, of uncertainty that people are dealing with around health right now. There is also more broadly, this continuing politicization of science, of experts, of what we should do around healthcare policy. Should we have the Affordable Care Act? Should we have something more like um, single payer, like we were hearing about in the Democratic primary season? Um, even sources of information about health. If the White House says, oh, we're doing better, things are improving, et cetera, et cetera, should we listen to that or should we listen to scientists, right? What's true? Who should I trust? I think. Um, an awful lot of Americans find themselves in this position where these competing sources of information are confusing. And so to go toward the sources that one generally tends to trust is what people might tend to do. Um, so people who don't trust government might not be inclined to listen to what the Trump administration is doing. Likewise, people who don't trust the mainstream media are very unlikely to listen to whatever's being sort of uh, offered as news in, um, in that context. We have then as well, before, long before COVID came onto the scene, 
a tremendous mental health care crisis in this country, right? Anxiety disorders of all varieties, depression, the opioid epidemic, increased suicide rates, and particularly in the context of this notion of deaths of despair, where individuals feel hopeless, where individuals feel, but right? My, my chances in life are much less good than what I believed they would be when I was a kid or than what my parents or my grandparents had before them. And I've lost hope entirely and I then die by suicide um, or by um, significant substance abuse. And the pandemic has made this worse, right? It's made it a lot worse. And I, so there's, just recently, a couple of weeks ago, this brilliant new article um, came out in one of the Journal of American Medicine, Medical Associations journals, um, their, um, their open access online journal, um, that has put together this fascinating study of depression symptoms, both before and during the early days of the COVID pandemic. And I had a lot more slides to show you around this, but I thought in the interest of time, I'd kind of cut some of them out. So I'm going to show you only the ones that I think are the most directly relevant to potential political outcomes in the fall. So first, and this is a pattern that we see across it, no matter how you sort of take the data and slice them up um, by demographic category, we see that rates of depressive symptoms are substantially higher, not just a little bit higher, but substantially higher um, in general terms. During, which during is defined in a study as March, April, May. Um, and then before the data they used are from 2017 and 2018. So obviously the green would be the before and the blue would be the during. So you see that men and women both became more likely to report depressive symptoms, but women's, the growth in depressive symptoms among women is quite a bit more substantial. They were at a higher level of depression to begin with, and now are at all, more than two thirds, or I'm sorry, more than one third of women are reporting significant depressive symptoms. Um, likewise, anxiety, I don't have data, there's not a good study I could find that was going to give you sort of a very clear, uh, well-organized um, uh, set of data like these data around anxiety, but we know that women are more likely than men to experience anxiety, and that very certainly is true. I did a little analysis of my own a few months ago, actually sort of as a side note, and I found that I looked at um, reported anxiety symptoms among women from data that were collected by Pew in March. And I found that um, women, first of all, I took the men out of the sample because I found that women were much more likely to report anxiety symptoms than men. Um, but also I found that um, obvious sorts of triggers for anxiety during COVID-19, such as I lost my job or I, my hours have been cut, that predicted anxiety, as one might expect. But equally powerful was disapproval of President Trump, right? So that suggests, is very suggestive of the importance of the political context in this, um, around the increase in negative mental health symptoms. So then let's take a look at this by age. And this, very certainly would also be the case if we were to look at anxiety instead of depression. But here what we see is in the before period, there was a little bit more likelihood, probably not even a statistically significant likelihood, but a little bit more likelihood among younger people to be depressed than people who are middle-aged and then people who are 60 plus. That very clearly is no longer the case. Young people, just it looks like about 39% of young people eight, ages 18 to 39. So faculty, this obviously this tends to be obviously the group that we're working with and the groups that we've worked with most recently um, have their rates of depression have skyrocketed. And older folks 
right, there's more depression, but they're in a much better place um, than younger folks are in this particular regard. Here's another slide that, and these data are from Pew, that show you, and this isn't just depression, this is psychological distress. And they, they, so they included a whole bunch of different sorts of measures. They found 33% of all adults had experienced, as it says, high levels, not just a little bit, high levels of psychological distress in March or April. And then if you break that down as they did by whether the outbreak has hurt their finances and whether or not they felt able to pay their bills in full this month, naturally, as you might expect, um, people who felt that their finances are now in worse shape than those of most people were way more likely to uh, suffer from psychological distress. Likewise, people who said that they can't pay some of their bills or they can only make a partial payment, much more likely to experience psychological distress. So there's the gender and age piece, but then there's also obviously this important socioeconomic piece. And you might be thinking, okay, how does this relate to politics? Well, gender, age, income, education have very powerful incredibly significant effects on both turnout and vote choice. We'll come back to that in a moment. So one more slide going back to the depression data. You see this, right, very same sort of thing that I just said. It was already the case in the before times, as I guess we're calling them, that people who were in the lowest income category experienced the most depression, which is, of course, not that surprising. Um, but again, the growth, if you look at the size of the growth in that category, um, getting close to, again, 50% of people who are making less than $20,000 a year are experiencing depressive sy symptoms, uh, began experiencing depressive symptoms or reported that they had depressive symptoms once the COVID-19 um, pandemic got underway. Um, and every income group, of course, has increased in their um, experience of depressive symptoms, but it is the people who are the most economically disadvantaged who are suffering most. So let's for a moment link this to politics. This really struck me when I saw this. The American Psychiatric Association in May reported that 56% of Americans were extremely or somewhat anxious about the impact of politics on daily life. So if you even remove COVID altogether, and right, because the polarization that we face in this country, the negative partisanship that Professor Fine introduced you to, et cetera, all of this, right, was pre-existent to the emergence of COVID, right? COVID just in a way sort of fits into this general narrative that we've been experiencing in this country for a while now. And so one of the sort of baseline situations that we as Americans are dealing with is this sense of, oh, politics, maybe back in the day I didn't worry about it so much, but now it is affecting my daily life. Now it is impinging upon somehow my sense of well-being psychologically, right? So there's that going on. There's also, it's important to know, there's this vicious cycle that tends to happen with people who experience anxiety. And I know because I do experience anxiety myself. When you're nervous about something, when you're worrying about something and you're in that spiral of, ah, the natural tendency for most people who experience anxiety is to almost obsessively look for information about that matter of anxiety. So you end up, if you're anxious about politics, if you're anxious about COVID, let's say, if you're anxious about the state of the economy, statistically speaking, you're likely to go and, and end up in this doom scrolling sort of mode where you're super hyper attentive to the news. And when you're in, right, if you're, if you're being hyper attentive to the news and it's making you nervous, it creates this vicious cycle, which of course is part of 
one hypothetical explanation, one very likely hypothetical explanation for the increase in not just depressive symptoms, but also anxious symptoms. So both anxiety disorders and depression thrive when people feel uncertain, when people perceive discrimination, which a lot of Americans are very powerfully doing, as we know right now, when they lack existential security. If I go to the grocery store, am I going to end up with a life-threatening illness, right? That's profound existential insecurity. When they lack connection, right, which we were already to a certain degree doing more than in previous generations, but with social distancing, of course, it becomes more difficult to feel connected. When they lack hope for the future, right, my the economy, I, I don't know where I'm headed, right? Things were bad to begin with maybe, and now I don't know what's going on, and meaning in life, right? We end up asking some of these questions that religion sometimes helps us deal with, but Americans, of course, are less religious than they once were. What is the meaning of my life, right? How can God let something like this happen, etc.? And each, as I was su suggesting before, each of those factors should have direct effects on turnout and vote choice. And there are so many ways we could think about this, right? If we think about turnout, if we think about anxiety, if I do not have the opportunity to vote by mail or to vote via absentee ballot, and I'm scared that I'm gonna go stand in line for eight hours and get sick, you know, chances are the more anxious I am about that, the more likely I am to say I'm not going to go. The more I sense that perhaps um, I maybe my vote won't count anyway if I feel that there are efforts to prevent me from voting, then I might, if I feel discriminated against, I am scared of what might happen if I go to the voting place, maybe I'm not going to vote. Um, if I lack hope for the future, I might think, uh, you know, doesn't matter who wins, I'm not going to bother to turn out. Then depression, of course, a lot of times depression makes you feel like you're swimming through mud. It's hard to get out of bed in the morning, do the dishes, much less go and turn out to vote. And voting can be costly, right? If I make less money, if I have food insecurity, if I have income insecurity, um, if I have, if I'm in poor physical health, that is going to be more, going to make it more difficult, or difficult rather for me to turn out to vote, right? Because the costs involved, and I don't mean financial necessarily, but broadly, the costs involved um, would be rather significant. And around vote choice too, if I'm terrified of four more years of Trump as president, then maybe that is a spur for me to turn out, right? And to going back to the slide where we saw um, Democrats, 59%, I think it was, or more of Democrats saying, I'm voting for Biden because he isn't Trump, right? That kind of spur might actually increase voter turnout. And we could go on and on. But one thing, two, actually two different things I want to focus on, and then we'll turn it over to questions. Um, Dr. Fine actually found these data from the Pew Research Center where voters were asked, do you think it'll be easy or difficult to vote in the fall? And here we see those data, right? All, if we look at all voters, less than a quarter of all voters think, ah, it's gonna be very easy. And then you have 50% saying, eh, yeah, somewhat easy. Suggesting what? That a good quarter of American voters think it isn't gonna be easy. And if we break that down by race and ethnicity, by age, by education, and by who they wanna go out and vote for, we see very, very important sort of, one might say, indications of what could come. African Americans, and Hispanics, but especially African Americans, do not tend to believe that voting is going to be easy. Likewise, younger people, much less likely than people, even in the 
third to 49 category seem to believe that voting is going to be easy. And then education doesn't have quite as much effect, but you can see that people with postgraduate degrees, and this is not surprising, are more likely to think, oh, right, it'll be easy. I've done this before. I can wrap my mind around this. And then most importantly of all, at the bottom, among those who support or lean toward Trump, voting's going to be easy. Among those who support or lean toward Biden, it isn't going to be easy. And so some of that very likely is an effect of race and ethnicity. Some of that might be an effect of gender. And some of it might be an effect of sort of people who are less well off, who might be more inclined, like the, the truly disadvantaged, that under $20,000 um, category of Americans tend to be Democrats. And so they are going to say, well, you know, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm facing all these challenges and it's going to be more difficult to vote. So should the Biden campaign be concerned about that? If, if you're a Biden supporter, you, yes, you should be concerned about that. And then one last slide here, because I can't resist. Expected emotional reactions to the election, to the outcome of the election. So Pew, which Pew, the Pew Research Center, I can't say enough good things about. If you're ever looking for good, really high quality gold standard data, they're a wonderful source. Um, so how am I gonna feel if A, Trump wins and I'm a Biden supporter or B, Biden wins and I'm a Trump supporter. Will I, or if my, or if my candidate wins, if I'm a Biden supporter and Biden wins, or I'm a Trump supporter and Trump wins. Am I going to be excited, relieved, disappointed, angry? The ones I have here in italics suggest something that is much more closely related to potential mental health challenges relieved suggests that I've been terrified, right? Oh, thank goodness this happened. Thank goodness my person won. Or angry, right? That's not just disappointed. I didn't need to tell you that, right? But angry, right? So it, there's maybe this anxiety and fear and then just visceral anger expected on the part of various voters if their person, if their candidate doesn't win. So here's some data. Um, all voters at the very top here, 14% um, excited, 28% relieved, 24% disappointed, and 33% angry. Suggesting, first of all, right off the bat, that if we add relieved and angry together, 28, 33, that's a very clear majority of Americans saying that their reaction is going to be something that, at least to me, feels like it's driven pretty powerfully by strong, strong emotion, um, the kind of emotion that drives depression and anxiety. Then break it down by Trump supporters. Um, so uh, in general, 30% um, are going to be excited, 61% relieved. Among Biden supporters, 37% disappoint. Oh, this is if Donald Trump wins. I'm sorry. This is if Donald Trump wins. Trump supporters, 61% relieved. Biden supporters, 61% angry. Right? So it, you end up seeing that the emotional reaction, the, the more strongly emotional reactions predominate. And then down here, this would be Biden. Right, again, you have relieved plus angry equals a majority, as was the case up above for Trump. And Trump supporters, if Biden wins, 37% will be angry. And if Biden wins, 77% of Biden supporters will be relieved. Right, so again, you can take a look at the slide um, yourself, but notice that the predominant emotion, right, is not, oh, cool right, or uh, bummer, like it might have been a generation ago. It is something quite different, right? It's something quite visceral. Um, and that is the situation that we are in the United States politically and it, politically in relation to um, mental health right now. So let's hear some 
questions? Anybody have questions? I have a question. Hi, my name is Marvita Jones. I work in the Department of Public Health Sciences. Um, and I actually teach an introduction to public health course in addition to my staff job. But I actually encourage my students to vote, um, of course, without trying to influence them either way. I actually put it in my syllabus, a link to the, the bipartisan or, or, or the nonpartisan voters campus project. Um, but anyway, South Carolina, if I understand correctly, I just moved here myself about six months ago, but South Carolina is a state where you need an excuse um, beyond COVID-19 fears to vote absentee. Is that still accurate? It's absolutely right. So but um, our so it, that, that has been true. Um, but I think I heard, I didn't, like maybe, maybe Jeff, you know, um, that maybe the governor has changed his mind about that. But up until, unless it's changed, yes, that's true. That said, I have a friend who went and said, I have to work that day. And that was an acceptable excuse. So is okay. it the case? Jeff, have you heard? Yeah, Kristen yeah, is saying in the chat, I think it changed this week. Yeah, I just a couple days ago, McMaster has changed this with an executive order. Yeah, so okay. that's what I thought. Right. At least for absentee voting. Right. Okay. Now, other states, it's much easier. You don't have mail voting. I just think it's very interesting that we're less than, you know, 60 days out and things are still kind of changing, which can add to more confusion and more voter suppression, really. So um, thank you for your presentation. I, I, I enjoyed both portions and both speakers. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your observation. It It is, it, when we think about voter suppression, we think some sometimes about over public policies, right? Um, you know, let's not have as many voting places, this, that, and the other, um, or threats of voter purges, et cetera. But there can also be, I think, these sort of very indirect ways of, of suppressing the vote by simply creating confusion around it, right? Oh, right. I don't know how to vote. I don't know where to vote. I, there's going to be long lines. I think if... Um, if, if President Trump continues to set the stage for a sense among voters that there's going to be fraud in the election, right? That sort of thing, it, it, it's very sort of indirect way of, um, of perhaps um, suppressing vote. I'm not sure if you guys have the chat open. It looks like there's a question in the chat from uh, Lee Crandall. Would you speak to the difference between being a Republican and being a quote unquote Trump supporter and to what extent do independents include Trump supporters? So in, in most of the polling stuff, I mean, it's self-reported as to whether you, like whether you say you're, you plan to support Trump this year. So, um, I mean, I think in this particular survey, it's based on self-identification. Um, more broadly, I think that there's these two different things, right? Which is, does someone consider themselves to be um, sort of part of Trump's base and does someone identify themselves as being a Republican. There's going to be a lot of overlap between those two things, but not necessarily perfect. So, um, you know, in 2016, you had lots of Republicans initially saying they couldn't support Trump. Um, but eventually, over 90% of Republicans, self-identified Republicans came back and still supported him on election day. And some of that is negative partisanship. They couldn't see themselves voting for Hillary Clinton. Um, but there are, they are distinct, I think, ideas about it, but at least in terms of the, the Pew data, I think it's all based on self-identification. It is self-identification, and what you end up with is some people say they're independent, but they're leaners, right? They, yeah, I'm going to say I'm independent, but 90% of the time I vote for Republicans, for example. Um, the, uh, Jeff just mentioned Hillary Clinton. That's a very, very important piece here. Um, Hillary Clinton, of course, is a much more polarizing figure than Joe Biden is. And Joe Biden is one of the things I think his campaign's being very smart about is he's trying to distinguish himself from President Trump through this idea of empathy, right? I understand that you're in pain. I understand that you're dealing with all these problems. And I, instead of using sort of a narrative that tends to deal in fear, Biden's campaign is trying to frame things up, I think quite a bit more around the notion of empathy. And so that, that if, if that's what some voters want, 
and if there are independent Republican and even people who self-identify as Republican who don't like the tone or have realized maybe uh, I don't know about the tone of the Trump administration that 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 creates perhaps a powerful pull on Biden's part by suggesting oh I'm I'm warm and I'm safe and I'm friendly and I'm non-threatening um, and that might specifically appeal to women, women in the suburbs, right? Which is the kind of classic thing that we think about, oh, who's gonna determine the, the outcome of the election? Women in suburbs in purple states, um, many of whom are, the, the surveys suggest, a um, little bit disillusioned with President Trump. So I see Kristen's question in the chat uh, about reversing the trends with respect to negative partisanship. Yeah, we've seen this. We've seen this trend pretty clearly happening over time, right? So um, people hate the other side more than they love their own side. Um, and you know, I don't know that we have great prescriptive solutions. Um, partly because these things have become so intertwined with our identity and who we who we see ourselves as being. And so, I mean, obviously, things like social media um, play into this and make it worse. Um, the like negative messages, negative messages spread more. That negativity gets more attention, and part of that is uh, because uh, President Trump is so negative there, and his messages get so much attention. So, you know, when you when you have a candidate centered, centered environment that's so, um, by his own design, focused on Trump, it's hard to sort of break that in some way. The other piece that's sort of interesting is there's lots of um, uh, political psychology work on things like this backfire effect. Uh, and so, you know, we, as an educator, I find this to be one of the more disturbing things. Uh, we, we tend to think that, you know, you get new information and that somehow like gets, gets, you know, shapes your worldview and information, especially good non-biased information can be helpful. Uh, and instead what we find is that when people get information that gets, goes against their, their own views, their own worldview, they actually get more entrenched against that new information. Um, so if, you know, I find out something, so, um, you know, one of the conspiracy theories in 2016 was that, uh, Hillary Clinton was running a, uh, like sex ring out of a pizza shop. Um, you know, you would think that once you get information that debunks this to say, this is factually untrue, that people will stop believing it. And instead what we find is when they get that information saying this is untrue, those people that identify the most with it and agree with it actually entrench and believe it more. And so it's hard to break this cycle because um, it now this is part of our identity. It, it's you know your brain tries to protect that, and the way it tries to protect that is by kind of locking down and putting up extra barriers. So um, it's 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 a difficult thing to try to break. Um, I mean, I think if you know that's going on, you can at least recognize it and your, yourself try to push back against it. But societally, I think we have a, a bigger challenge on our hands. That's absolutely right. And that goes to this idea of uncertainty. If I'm living in this world of tremendous uncertainty, not knowing where to look for answers, not knowing where to look for support, not knowing what is going to happen tomorrow, and being kind of terrified, one thing that we tend to do is we tend to look for some source of certainty, some kind of grand explanation for what on earth is going on. And you might not think, right, the QAnon's conspiracy theory, QAnon's conspiracy theory about the sex ring, etc. you would think, oh, all right, that's kind of far-fetched. I go, okay, conspiracy theories and UFOs and this kind of thing. But most people, not so, right? Because it ends up being this narrative that not only provides a great explanation, but also creates in a way this sort of sub-identity for people, right? And it's almost this little secret thing like Q, like what is Q? Nobody knows, now more people know what it is, right? But it, it's like, I know that I have my people out there who are like me because they believe this stuff is true. And there's a, this is something I've been thinking about. There's a certain extent to which in a society where we are increasingly disconnected from one another. And part of that, that's Robert Putnam made this classic argument actually 20 years ago now already, um, called which he sort of titles bowling alone, right? That we Americans are not engaged in thing like 
fun things that bring us together and help us understand each other and that get us out of any kind of potential silos. Like if I'm in a bowling league, you know, so I might have been right. So I'm in a bowling league, I might be in a bowling league with people from all kinds of different backgrounds, right? That we just happen to come together and bowl together once a week. But we don't do that anymore, right? And increasingly, we are we are isolated. Increasingly, we are reliant on our devices, and that's before COVID, to interact with other people. And it what it does is it allows us to go down our own little rabbit hole and not be aware of the challenges of people who live different kinds of lives because we don't know any of them. And so what we want is we want to be reinforced in what it is that we think we are, right? We want our own identities built up. And if in the absence of voluntary associations and just generally hanging out, talking to other people um, or attending in, you know, many cases, worship, services and, and prayers, et cetera, because we don't do that as much in the United States anymore, then we lack understanding and we look at something that's other and we get terrified of it and we want to run from it and we want to go back to sources of information that reinforce what we already believe. We've got a few more minutes if we've got additional questions. It looks like Jenny might have a question. <laughs> I have a question. Thank you, Dr. Fine and Dr. Olson. That was really interesting. Um, but I'm curious, you talk about all these things that are factors that are kind of still in a state of flux, like, you know, your local COVID count or your mental health on election day. Um, so I'm wondering what you think that has to do with, with how accurate polling data might be um, at this point and even closer to the election. Can we can we pay any attention to it or are we dealing with too many factors to, to make it useful? I, I, I tended, I mean, I know there was lots of attention about the polls and that the, like the po polls are wrong. There's, you know, the, the view that there are secret Trump voters that just aren't responding to polls. There's just not a lot of good evidence to suggest that's actually happening. Um, so I trust the polls, but you have to keep in mind that you know, polls are a snapshot of what's happening today. And so those things can change. Um, so I think the polls are actually fairly accurate. You just have to understand that all polls have a margin of error and that margin of error. So I see that misinterpreted in the media a lot. If there's a four and a half point margin of error, that means that for us to really think there's a lead, it has to be at least nine points because it's four and a half points on each side. And that's misinterpreted often. But, um, you know, right now, it seems pretty clear that Biden is leading at least in the presidential race. But there's lots of people that are still yet to sort of say how they, you know, who they're going to vote for. So there is a chance for those to change as those independents or people that are unsure come out of the woodworks and actually sort of declare affiliation later. But I think in terms of like where things stand now, <clears throat> I feel good about saying the polls are accurate, but they certainly, things can change as news shifts. Right. That's right. Things can change as news shifts. And the president is fond of trying to in a heavy handed way shape the news cycle. We're also going to have debates. We don't know what that's going to look like, right? And who knows if there could be dramatic world events. You never know from one day to the next. Could there be dramatic world events? Um, the fires out west, for example, or who knows, right? Um, and so I always like to say that um, it, a month or two can be an eternity in politics. And so we never know for sure. One thing to do though, is to watch sort of, if you go on Real Clear Politics or someplace else that aggregates polls, um, watch and see if the margin between Biden and Trump is gradually getting closer and closer. And that, if that's the case, think to yourself first, all oh, right, maybe if there's people out there who don't know who they're voting for, maybe they're deciding. Also though, it, you know, if you think, oh, Biden's way ahead and he's way ahead and oh, you hedge your bets a little bit. And if you're a Trump supporter, think, well, maybe he can come back. If you're a Biden supporter, think, well, maybe I'm not quite as confident as I was. We've got time for one more question, if anyone has one. Um, I have a question. Hi, my name is Rowan. I'm a health science major. Thanks, Dr. Olson and Dr. Fine for speaking. I really enjoyed it. 
So I don't know if this question is necessarily out of the scope of today, um, but I read a study that found that uninsured patients were much less likely to even be registered to vote and to vote, resulting in less funding for the states um, that had, you know, high populations of uninsured patients for programs to help those who are uninsured with their health care and so on and so forth. So I was wondering, um, what role does policy play in helping our medical system to address these issues? Um, because they can often be unwelcome or controversial in a medical environment. That's right. Um, I, the policy piece, I have to think about that a little bit more, but what a brilliant question. Um, the, the general idea here, the general explanation for what you observed and what you read would be lower income folks less likely to have health insurance and less likely because they're less well educated chances are that right, one reason why they might be lower income is they're less well educated and those two pieces go hand in hand and both of them suppress not just the likelihood of turning out but like you said being registered in the first place and there's also this sort of oh i right i got enough worries in my life much less vote. Um, and Dr. Fry might have a different view, but my own view is that unless the United States decides not to tie health care coverage to employment, that that isn't going to change. And the power of, as you know, big pharma and big health care, uh, the lobbying advantage, right, the their control over public policy or their impact on public policy is so great right now um, that it's it's hard for people who are not part of that universe in terms of lobbying to get any kind of foothold. So. And just to add to that, I think I agree with everything Dr. Olson said. I would say there's two things that are related to this question of um, people that are uninsured and voter registration and voting. One is the, the, the insurance side, who's actually uninsured. And I think Dr. Olson discussed that really well. The other side of it is the voter registration side. We live in a country where voter registration is not automatic, at least in most states. And so you have to take an affirmative step to get registered and you have to do it well enough in advance of election day to do that. And so people who um, are low income, people who work minimum wage jobs, people that, that you know, have more, work multiple jobs, have a much harder time being insured from their employer in the first place, but also taking, being able to take the steps necessary to register to vote you're much more likely to have to move from housing through being evicted or through temporary housing. And you might have to change your voter registration depending on where you've moved to. So, you know, until we actually have automatic voter registration, until we have actual election day as a federal holiday, which it should be to increase access to the polls. And until we have, you know, more people insured, I mean, there's many states that did not expand Medicaid. And so you have some people that are uninsured in those states who, you know, economically they're disadvantaged in the first place, and then you compound that with the difficulty of registering and voting, um, it's really a, a double whammy there. So I think it's a, a great question, um, but also one that's um, got really important policy implications there. Great, what a fantastic question to end on. Thank you so much, Roy. And thank you again, Dr. Olson and Dr. Fine. This was fascinating. I certainly learned a lot uh, today, and I think it gives us a lot to think of about going into the election. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Have a great weekend, and we hope to see you at our next um, lecture and all the from same Zoom, Zoom place. Um, and now I'm, I believe it's October 2nd is our next one coming up. So have a great weekend. Take care. Thank you all. Thanks, thank you. Have a good weekend. Stay safe. Don't get COVID. <laughs> <laughs>